Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar on how to address emerging industry trends using computational modelling and simulation during the development cycle. I'd like to introduce to you today, today's speaker, Carl D'Souza. Carl is a CMNS professional with experience in technology consulting, product management and business development as they pertain to simu simulation-based solutions for science and technology companies. At DASA System, he is responsible for managing design and engineering solutions for medical devices, biopharmaceuticals and patient care. There'll be time for a Q&A at the end of this presentation, so please uh, make use of the red ask question button on your screen. Thank you, and over to you, Carl. Welcome to you all to today's webinar on your new RX for safe and effective medical devices, computational modeling and simulation. Um, it's my pleasure to be able to present to you our thoughts in this area. Our outline for today will be as follows. I will begin with uh, a brief introduction to the medical devices industry, in particular to some of the business drivers and challenges that our customers are facing today. That will then lead us into the central purpose of this webinar today, which is to introduce you to our new solution to address some of those challenges called Engineer to Cure. Uh, as this is quite a comprehensive solution, we won't have time to talk about all aspects of it, so we'll spend a few minutes looking at a select industry processes within the overall solution and talking about some of its scope and applications. Then we'll shift gears a little bit and talk about a topic of much interest today, which is the automation and democratization of modeling and simulation, and we'll look in particular at an example from the cardiovascular space. Finally, I'll wrap it up with a summary and conclusions, reiterating some of the key points, and then we can open up, open it up to Q&A depending on the time that we have left. So with that, let's get started. <clears throat> so as I'm sure most of you are familiar with, there exists a very wide range of medical devices and equipment uh, out there. And what you're seeing here is some images just illustrating uh, what some of our customers are doing with medical devices and products. For instance, on the left, you can see the Da Vinci surgical robot system on the top. Uh, on the left in the middle is the 3D printed arterial models that our partners use for surgical planning. And at the bottom, you can see portable DNA sequencing kits. Moving on to the right, at the top, you see wearable ECG monitors being developed again by one of our partners. You can see insulin injector pens, and on the bottom, you can see a cardiovascular stent along with its delivery catheter. In the middle, then, you see one of our partners displaying a pretty highly sophisticated bionic implant. And I hope it's clear from this that our customers are using our solutions to design and develop a very broad spectrum of medical devices, from very simple mechanical gadgets to very complex mechatronic systems, as you can see here. So let's now look at what are some of the external forces of what we at Tesla Systems like to call industry drivers that are affecting the medical devices industry today. The first one we see is a growing incidence of complex chronic diseases such as cancer, heart disease, metabolic syndromes, and other age and lifestyle related conditions that are imposing huge socioeconomic costs on society. As you can see in the chart, healthcare costs are sometimes growing faster than GDP in many developed countries, and there is a pressing need to improve healthcare efficiency or treatment outcomes, which of course affects medical device and drug companies alike. The second driver is growing regulatory pressure facing medical device companies, and that can be measured by perhaps the number of adverse events and device recalls. As device makers rush to bring new devices to market, they are often unable to test all possible use case conditions, which increases the risk of patient harm and device recalls. For instance, between 2009 and 2019, device failures were implicated in the death of more than 83,000 patients, and there were more than 100 million device unit recalls in 2019 alone. Third, there has been a rapid influx of medical device startups in recent years. By virtue of their agility and innovative speed, these new players can quickly carve out market space for themselves, thereby placing additional competitive pressure on incumbents. 
Here we see an example of one of our partners that develops personalized 3D printed models that can be used for pre-surgical planning. To compete in an env environment like this, established players are under pressure to become more agile themselves and capitalize on, on emerging patient needs. And finally, we're also seeing a rise in patient autonomy, which not only means that patients want to stay in their treatment, but also that patient comfort, accessibility, and overall satisfaction can determine if a device succeeds in the marketplace. Another DASO partner shown here develops wearable EEG and ECG sensors that can allow for 24-7 remote monitoring of patients, thereby enhancing the patient's overall health and independence. So let's look at what this means in terms of challenges that our customers are dealing with. As you can see on the right, what we hear all the time when speaking to our customers is that they are facing challenges to increase medical device efficacy, whether it be a treatment device or a diagnostic device. How to manage medical device complexity? How to improve the patient and the clinician experience? How to reduce reliance on animal or clinical trials? And to do all of this while minimizing the risk of adverse events, moving towards more personalized treatments, accelerating the approval process, and like we saw before, capitalizing on unmet or emerging patient needs. All of these challenges mean that our customers are faced with significantly high product development and long development cycle times, and are constantly looking for solutions to lower them. So this then brings us to the key message, which is how can we reduce these high development times and costs by using computational modeling and simulation to generate defensible evidence in a much shorter period of time. So that sets us up for the second part, which is now we'll go into the solution a little bit. So how might modeling and simulation help? So when we consult with our customers today, uh, they all agree that one of the key problems is the heavy reliance on physical testing of medical devices. As I'm sure you well know, many devices must go through extensive bench and animal testing, which can significantly extend time to market and development costs. Moreover, if the device fails in clinical trials, device makers must repeat the entire process, thus doubling the time to market and cost. Finally, due to the inadequacy of physical testing, there remains a significant degree of untested use cases or unquantified risk. Having worked with our key partners, we believe that the introduction or the expansion of virtual or in silico testing of devices is a key solution to this problem. The systematic use of in silico testing allows for vastly more design alternatives to be tested earlier on in the development cycle greatly reduces reliance and therefore cost and time of bench and animal testing, provides quantitative and actionable insights to optimize device performance, and helps streamline and accelerate the regulatory approval process. So if we accept the promise of virtual testing, the next logical question to ask is what would it take to get there? As in what features would such a solution need? We like to refer to these features as, as the three pillars, and we believe that the three key pillars are realistic simulation, virtual human modeling, and standardization and automation. So let's dig a little deeper into each of these. Let's start with the first one. Having worked with medical device engineers for many years, we know that the first step is access to a rigorous simulation foundation capable of modeling real-world phenomena. If we are to reduce reliance on physical testing, then we must rely on accurate and efficient simulation of the structural, fluidic, thermal, kinetic, and other phenomena these devices can undergo in their operating conditions. We can then apply these fundamental multiphysics simulation techniques to specific medical devices and equipment, such as drug delivery devices, imaging systems, cardiovascular implants, and so on. Doing so will help us across relevant business processes from device design through validation and quality and compliance. And the good news is that simulation and simulation from the source systems is already being used in the design and development of all sorts of medical devices, as we shall shortly see. Now, even though a rigorous simulation foundation is necessary, it's in no way sufficient to realize our goal. 
This is because medical devices must operate within the context of the human body. It's an operating environment, which is in many ways more complex, more variable, and less well understood than man-made systems. However, it's critical that our virtual test paradigm be able to quantitatively predict the short-term and long-term impact of the human body on the device and of the device on the body. This is why virtual human modeling is becoming increasingly critical to our customers. We've been improving the accuracy, efficiency, and methodology of modeling human tissues like skin, muscle, and bone, human organs like the heart and the brain, and complex partial or whole body systems such as the knee, the spine, or even the complete musculoskeletal system. We believe that virtual human modeling is a game-changing capability that will empower the development of better, more robust, and more personalized medical devices. And finally, although the first two pillars are important, we still, we still need something more. This is because truly eliminating or even substantially reducing reliance, reliance on animal and human testing requires the ability to account for the high variability seen in the real world and a way in which to do it systematically and scalably. This means transforming simulation from an artisanal narrow endeavor to a broadly usable and democratized enterprise-wide process. It means extensive process automation and data management within a collaborative cross-disciplinary development environment. It, moves, it means moving from a deterministic and conservative approach to a stochastic and risk-managed approach. All of this requires a platform that can systematically and intelligently analyze the effects of key parameters, representing both the device and the patient, enabling the resulting knowledge to be visualized and acted upon in a timely manner, and manage all virtual test data and metadata to meet increasingly stringent quality and regulatory standards. With these three pillars in place, we think, we believe we can help our customers not only accelerate the development of novel devices for unmet needs, but also develop increasingly personalized devices that can enhance the patient experience and the treatment outcome. This is exactly what our new industry solution called Engineer to Cure is intended to accomplish, as you can see here. The primary purpose of this solution is to help our customers develop safe and effective medical devices using collaborative design and simulation. Some of the key benefits that this pro solution provides are the ability to increase medical device safety and effectiveness, reduce cost and time of new product development, improve patient satisfaction and treatment outcome, reduce the likelihood of adverse events and device recalls, and innovate on novel medical devices to satisfy patient needs. So let's unpack this solution a bit more. Now, the way we at Jasso deliver our solutions is via a set of carefully packaged industry process experiences, each tailored to a specific business process that may consist of one or more workflows performed by a single or multiple end users. Here we can see the six industry process experiences that comprise the engineer to cure solution arranged around the compass. Very briefly, I'll talk about each of them. The device requirements engineering and validation process helps project managers and systems architects create, manage, change, and validate device requirements with full end-to-end -end traceability. It also allows systems engineers to rapidly explore device and patient variability and develop robust and personalized devices. Therefore, it helps ensure medical devices meet all of their performance, quality, and compliance requirements. The next human factors design is used to allow device engineers and analysts to evaluate the patient and caregiver experience in the conceptual phase of the design and thereby reduce the risk of human error and late stage design modifications. Device mechanical engineering allows device makers to design and virtually validate the mechanical performance of devices, thus improving their safety and reliability while avoiding costly physical testing. Device electromagnetics performance, allows device makers to virtually validate the reliability and performance of smart connected medical devices and to ensure that medical devices and equipment meet electromagnetic safety standards, again, while avoiding costly physical testing. With virtual human modeling, our customers can assess device safety and efficacy in validated human models and develop patient and population specific models to reduce reliance on animal and clinical testing. 
Finally, with standard component management, device makers can optimize the component sourcing process and streamline the introduction of new parts to meet performance, compliance, and other enterprise-wide objectives. Since we don't have time to cover all these processes in detail today, we will focus on the processes highlighted on the left, briefly touching on the others. Please make sure you attend the other two webinars in this series to learn more about all of these processes. With that, I will transition over to the next section where we look at some of our processes in detail. So let's start off with device mechanical engineering, which comprises the most mature, most used workflows in the medical device industry today, and is typically the entry point for most customers looking to adopt modeling and simulation. Here we can see some of the key workflows that are provided as part of the device mechanical engineering solution. Beginning with physical design of the device, which can be done directly on the 3D experience platform or imported from an external CAD system such as SOLIDWORKS. We provide solutions for the most important medical device validation workflows, such as calibration of complex and novel materials, evaluation of product integrity and durability under typical operating conditions, reliability of the device under drop or impact situations, and a host of other common and important scenarios involving the fluidic, thermal, and acoustic response of the, of the device. The benefits of doing so are quite clear. Customers can reduce device validation time by 50%, cut late stage failure rate by half, and engineer medical devices that result in zero recalls. So to get a better sense of what this means in practice, I thought it would be worthwhile to look at a very important and fast growing product category, combination products. Essentially, these are products that are comprised of two or more regulated components and sit at the intersection of medical devices and pharmaceuticals. This definition encompasses a wide range of products, ranging from inhalers to drug eluting stents to transdermal patches and more. Here we see the IASO Oncology Wearable Injector, which is a virtual medical device designed by us at the cell systems, really as a showcase with which to demonstrate our solutions. We can list a few performance metrics that designers of such products need to consider, such as product reliability and durability, ease of administration by a clinician or the patient, patient comfort and safety, which might imply minimal skin damage and rapid drug delivery. Now, from our experience with this class of devices, we have identified four simulation workflows shown below. Device integrity, fluid device interaction, device skin interaction, and electromagnetics. Let's examine some of these. On the left here, we're studying the integrity of the ISO injector under drop conditions. In this case, we're dropping it from a height of five feet. To protect the touch-sensitive glass interface, we compare various shock mitigation strategies, such as using an energy-absorbing casing or adding an absor absorptive cladding zone around the glass region itself. Using such simulations, we can precisely quantify the level of damage and identify the regions requiring attention, thus allowing the designer to obtain satisfactory design performance at minimal additional cost. Moving over to the right side here, we look at how fluid device interaction, which is another critical determinant of how the overall drug device system performs. In this case, we are using fluid structure interaction between Abacus and XFlow to simulate the operational performance of the peristaltic pump, which is used in the ISO injector under a range of drug viscosities, pump geometries, and tubing material behaviors to identify the optimal overall design for a given drug formulation. Now, minimizing delivery time and patient discomfort means that we need to understand the needle penetration problem. A human skin is a highly nonlinear, anisotropic, and multilayered material whose characteristics depend on age, body mass index, moisture content, and other variables. At the source systems, we have spent much time developing and validating models of human skin and other tissues that can be used to study the needle penetration problem in detail, as you can see here on the left. Now, once the drug is introduced into the body, it must have the right dispersion behavior. 
Precise control over the drug's region of influence requires modeling the biophysical characteristics of skin in conjunction with the device drug system. In particular, skin layers can have widely varying porosity and permeability, which will determine the fluid distribution in the skin, which will in turn modify the boundary conditions of the needle penetration fluid injection problem. We offer a complete solution for this fairly complex multi-physical problem. Let's take a look at our second solution of interest today, which is device electromagnetics performance. So there are essentially four classes of applications that use electromagnetic simulation as shown here. Let's go counterclockwise from the top left. As we've already seen, medical devices are becoming increasingly more sophisticated and can in fact be thought of as smart connected devices where 24 seven connectivity is critical for patient diagnostics and remedial response. Here we use electromagnetic simulation to ensure their connectivity, reliability, and safety. The next most popular application class is medical imaging systems. These machines are being routinely used in patient diagnostics and are becoming increasingly powerful. So there is high interest in reducing development time and cost by increasing the use of virtual testing for electromagnetic performance and safety. The third category concerns the safety of patients with embedded metallic implants when exposed to external electromagnetic fields that can induce undesirable heating in the implants or can interfere with their caref carefully calibrated electronic behavior, both of which can have serious consequences for patients and device makers alike. And finally, on the top right, we see an emerging class of use cases around the use of electromagnetic energy for therapeutic purposes. Perhaps the main example here would be electromagnetic induced tumor ablation, where it is important to apply the right dose of energy in the right location to efficiently excise cancerous region while causing minimal damage to the surrounding healthy tissue. As before, let's take a look at one of these applications in practice. Let's look at the first, the same device we saw before, the ISO uh, device. Essentially here we are using electromagnetic simulation to optimize the positioning of the onboard electronic circuit and the antenna. We begin by defining a flexible PCB and a Wi-Fi or Bluetooth antenna along the contours of the device, which restrict our design space. We can then compute the electromagnetic coupling between the PCB and the antenna, and we can easily explore different positioning of these components until we have reached an optimal location. We can compute the far field radiation pattern from the antenna both in free space and when the device is worn on the wrist using the human modeling capabilities provided as part of the solution. Finally, we can evaluate the level of electromagnetic radiation exposure in the patient's body to ensure that our device design is compliant with the regulatory requirements set by whatever country we intend to market the product in. Let's conclude this section with a quick look at one of our customers, WS Audiology, the leading developer of hearing aids. In this case, the customer was faced with a couple of challenges. One is that hearing aid comprises multiple different wireless systems that are all in close proximity with each other and can thus interfere with each other, degrading overall performance. The second challenge, as we just saw, is to ensure uninterrupted connectivity between the device and a nearby smartphone used to control it. They were able to overcome both challenges using the device electromagnetics performance solution to identify potential problems with electromagnetic component design and placement, and also to rapidly explore multiple scenarios and select the optimal configuration without the use of expensive physical prototypes and test as would normally have been needed. So let's now move on to the last process we'll talk about today, which is the virtual human clinic. This is a unique and truly differentiating solution that realizes many years of strategic investment by our company and is really enabling our customers transform their device development methodologies and timelines. So as we've just been discussing, computational modeling and simulation is a proven capability for medical device development and is increasingly being accepted by regulatory bodies such as the FDA, but several challenges remain. First, unlike in other industries, 
in life sciences or in med devices, there are generally no well-accepted standard numerical models of a human operating environment. Therefore, design loads and boundary conditions are defined by each device manufacturer independently and are not necessarily consistent across the industry, which of course presents a challenge for regulatory bodies to assess or certify a specific device. Moreover, the human operating environment is typically greatly simplified when, when a bench test is used and patient variability is hard to accommodate and so is seldom explored. Now, creating and exploring patient-specific models is effort-intensive and time-consuming, which means insufficient numbers of representative patients can be evaluated, which in turn means that the safe and effic efficacious performance space of a device is incompletely described or not so well understood. And finally, the full pedigree and provenance of simulation-based evidence are hard to develop and manage, especially for large numbers of in silico tests. And so defensibility of large collections of results is currently incomplete. The virtual human clinic solution is designed to overcome these challenges and to de deliver tangible benefits of accelerating the development of reliable and safe medical devices, reducing the cost and effort of obtaining defensible clinical evidence, and improving device safety and reducing unquantified risk. Now, again, to make this a little bit more tangible, let's look at a concrete example. Some of you may know that the Living Heart model is our first commercial realization of all these ideas. And since its success essentially inspired the virtual human clinic solution, I'd like to say a few words about the Living Heart model. Essentially, this model is an anatomically realistic model of a healthy four-chamber, 50th percentile adult male human heart. Its dynamic response is governed by coupled electrical, structural, and fluid flow physics. You can use the model to study disease cardiac function by modifying certain model attributes, such as the loads, the boundary conditions, the geometry, or the material properties. You can also introduce medical devices into the living heart model to study their influence on cardiac function, evaluate their safety, and explore treatment options. This model has been extensively evaluated by a large number of external researchers, and a lot of literature is available for those of you interested at 3 years. It's also been used to evaluate the performance of a number of cardiovascular devices, such as stents, valves, leads, as shown here on the bottom. Let's take a look at one of these examples in particular. So as you may know, we have several customers designing cardiovascular, in particular coronary stents, who must ensure that the stents do not become dislodged or migrate or succumb to fatigue failure despite the large cyclic motions and deformations they are subjected to within the cardiac arteries. You can see in this video here how the living heart model can be used to visualize exactly how a stent will respond at a particular location in the coronary artery. Not only can we visualize its behavior, we can also compute the cyclic stresses experienced by the stent as shown in the top right image, from which we can estimate its fatigue life using the device mechanical engineering solution discussed earlier. Moreover, we can then use parametric and topology optimization techniques to explore how changes to the stent design may be able to extend its fatigue life. In this case, as you can see in the image on the bottom right, we were able to extend life by almost 15% using a combination of parametric and topology optimization. Now I'd like to conclude this section by briefly mentioning that Abbott has been using the living heart model to evaluate a new generation of cardiovascular implants, which of course must perform flawlessly under all possible in vivo operating conditions. In particular, they were trying to understand device behavior under exercise conditions, which, as you can see from the table shown here, features a number of changes to cardiac physiology that need to be modeled accurately. 
The Living Heart model provides an ideal framework to conduct such abnormal excursions in heart behavior and to study abnormal heart device interactions and can easily be extended to capture the variability in either anatomy or physiology that would be expected in a real-world clinical trial, but obviously much faster and at a fraction of the cost. So now that we've covered some of the key simulation domains that we intended to, I'd like to shift gears a little bit and talk more about productivity. I'm going to use the example of a stent since we just talked about it a few minutes ago, but I'm sure you'll see that the methodology presented here is applicable to any medical device uh, and, in fact, to any designed or engineered product. Okay, so let's begin with the current, or what we're calling the as-is process of stent design today. So today, a stent designer will probably spend some time on the ideation process, trying to understand the requirements and capturing them, after which they will sketch out a 2D or a planar stent diagram, or sometimes maybe build the, the full 3D CAD model. This data will then be handed over to a simulation expert who will construct the 3D simulation model of the stent, go ahead and assign appropriate material properties, then conduct the relevant virtual test, such as bending, crimping, cyclic loading, as we saw earlier, then evaluate the results, and perhaps conduct a sensitivity analysis. After all of that is done, and if the stent is deemed insufficiently performant or robust, then the designer must decide if a minor design change will meet the requirements or if a more fundamental back to the drawing board changes are needed. Either way, because of this divide between the designer and the analyst, a lot of time is lost communicating back and forth using files, emails, perhaps incompatible databases or CAD formats and so on, and there is a high chance of miscommunication, human error, and overall delay. Moreover, this exclusive reliance on simulation knowledge and know-how means that only a fraction of the design space can be explored in the available time, and it's most likely that a suboptimal design will be chosen. All of this, of course, means that the full potential of simulation is not currently being realized. So what can we do about this? Well, in this particular case, since this workflow is well understood and mature, we can go ahead and standardize a series of steps that are needed to be conducted, as shown here. We can, for instance, specify exactly how the 2D design should be developed, and then how the 3D simulation model should be constructed from it. We can specify exactly what tests should be conducted and how the test scenario should be defined using either the standard set of bench tests or, as we've seen, more advanced in vivo tests using the living heart model. Then we construct the specific sequence of computational modeling that is needed, including multi-physics simulations if appropriate. At this point, we can now start developing easy-to-use interfaces or templates that expose only a small set of parameters so that non-experts can start using them. As part of these templates or apps, we can expose the end user to results information that is easy to comprehend and actionable. Effectively, what we are able to do here is we can reduce the reliance on simulation experts so designers can make the right decisions faster. We can improve device performance and safety by ensuring validation is error-free. And we can accelerate the approval process since everything done here is relevant, standardized, and streamlined. So let's look at some of these steps a little bit closer. As I just mentioned, the designer will typically construct the 2D parametric sketch of a single unit cell of the stent, specifying its length, thickness, height, angle between the struts, and so on. <clears throat> From this, they will then construct the full 2D pattern by translation and offsetting, specifying the number of struts and other, other relevant parameters. Finally, the 3D geometric model will be constructed from the 2D design. So let's take a look at a short video demonstrating this process. What you're seeing here is a fully parameterized model of a stent. You can see all the parameters in the model tree, and you can change them easily and look at those changes, look at the effect of those changes instantaneously. 
In this case, he's shortening the segment length, and we can see how those changes affect the design. Then he goes ahead and changes the thickness or whatever other parameters uh, that need to be that need to be modified. I'm sure you can already see how having these parameters well defined makes it much easier to set up automatic design space exploration to identify optimal designs. Okay, so let's say we've gone through most of the steps and now we have a robust process in place. Now we can create very simple templates that the designer or indeed anyone else can use to explore different design options. So here what we're seeing is a web-based template that's been created specifically for STEM designers. As you can see, only a few parameters are exposed and their ranges are predetermined so that unacceptable designs will not be considered. The user can choose which set of bench tests are to be conducted. And note again that these test scenarios are already pre predetermined so no expertise is required on behalf of the end user. They can then choose what simulation resolution is needed, course of fine mesh, and also how many CPUs to throw at the problem, which will determine overall turnaround time. Finally, the user submits the simulation job, and once it's completed, they are presented with, again, a predetermined set of results that can help them make a decision on whether the design meets their needs or whether further design options should be considered. You can easily see how such a template could be deployed across the company so that anyone authorized to explore design options can do so easily and without the need for simulation exploits to be part of the effort. So we've looked at putting simulation in the hands of a STEM designer, but we can also automate more complex tasks that are typically in the domain of the simulation expert. Here we are looking again at a web-based application to conduct a much more extensive and detailed exploration of parameter space using, using specialized techniques for high-performance computation, including design of experiments, surrogate models, response services, and so on. Using these approaches, we can automatically compare various designs against multidisciplinary objective functions and select the most optimal design. Again, you can see how use of these templated approaches for both routine and more complex tasks can lead to better and faster exploration of the available design space, and consequently more confidence in the final chosen designs. So what does all of this mean? I think the key benefits that we can get by standardizing and automating the validation process for both routine and complex tasks is that once the simulation expert has developed, tested, and codified the workflows, all necessary steps can then be conducted by the design engineer or indeed anyone else. This can greatly expand simulation capacity, often by an order of magnitude or more, as shown here, and thereby reduce overall design cycle time, sometimes by up to 70%, as you can see here that we've got from typical customer cases. Moreover, by freeing up experts and analysts to focus on more advanced tasks, such as perhaps human population modeling, or experimenting with truly novel therapeutic mechanisms, device makers can capitalize on emerging and unmet patient needs and further increase the value of simulation. So it's now time to wrap up today's webinar and I'd like to move on to a summary and conclusion. I want, I'd like to conclude today's webinar by spending a few minutes reiterating the key benefits of our engineer to cure solution. Firstly, our solution is delivered on the 3D Experience platform, which is a unified business and engineering platform, and as such facilitates seamless collaboration among all stakeholders across the enterprise. Not only designers and analysts, as we looked at today, but also systems engineers, software developers, QA, marketing, sales, suppliers, in fact, even external people such as clinicians and patients themselves. Since every, everyone can access a single source of information, the information bandwidth can be greatly enhanced. Second, as I hope you'll agree, we need comprehensive multi-physics simulation to model the real world behavior, not only of the device, but also of the patient. And we also need multi-scale simulation to efficiently and accurately model phenomena such as model phenomena at the molecular, cellular, tissue, or organ levels. Third, 
we've taken a look at how integrated modeling and simulation, or what we call ModSim, can help transfer much of the routine simulation work into the hands of the designer. While this may increase validation cost early in the conceptual phases, we can clearly see how in the longer term, the area under the cost curve is much less when we use an integrated modeling mod sim approach, uh, which, is exact, which is why this is an area of high interest among, among our customers today. So along the same lines, we also looked at how integrated mod sim helps easily compose custom processes, integrating all design and simulation disciplines, tools, and data and allows device makers to automatically and efficiently explore design trade-offs to converge on the optimal and most robust design. Last but not least, in our solution, modeling and simulation is itself tightly integrated or woven within a collaborative model-based systems engineering framework that allows for rapid systems-level modeling and optimization as well as guarantees requirements management and end-to-end -end traceability, which can accelerate the regulatory approval process. More on this topic in a future webinar, so stay tuned. I'd like to conclude the presentation by summarizing again the key benefits, which are listed here for your reference, increasing medical device safety and effectiveness, reducing cost and time of new product development, improving patient satisfaction and treatment outcome, reducing likelihood of adverse events and device recalls, and allowing the innovation on novel medical devices to meet unmet or emerging patient needs. Before we wrap up for today, I'd just like to point out a few sources of further information for those of you that are interested. On the top is the landing page for our solution engineer to cure on the 3DS website. Once you get there, you can find articles such as those on your right, which is an ebook on why modeling and simulation is important for medical devices. And there's also a neat 20-minute uh, long webinar on simulation in life sciences, primarily targeted at SOLIDWORKS users. On the bottom left, you can find a link to an expanded version of the No One Orders case study that I talked about briefly today. You can also find a lot of information on a dedicated page on the topic of ModSim. That's, uh, that's very frequently updated and a lot of useful information there. And finally, for those of you who want to learn more about virtual human modeling or the living heart model in particular, there's also a link contained within there that will take you to the living heart page uh, and expose you to all of the very interesting and fascinating work that's being done there. Thank you, Carl, for your really interesting presentation. Um, we now have some time for some questions, so please use your ask a question button submit to submit any questions that you might have. Um, so moving to our first question, um, what impact does using a computer modeling and simulation method have in saving time in the development process? Okay, um, can you hear me fine, Natalie? Yes, I can. Yes, okay. Well, thank you to everybody for attending the webinar and uh, happy to take these questions. Uh, this is a very pertinent question, so thanks for raising it. And uh, so certainly the, the, the key purpose or the main reason for adopting a computational modeling and simulation approach is to save on overall development time and cost. And there's a couple of ways in which that actually happens in practice. I think on a more practical, explicit way is when you're able to reduce your reliance on, on physical testing. So for example, if you can replicate the situation that you might be conducting in a laboratory or in a bench setting accurately enough through simulation, of course you can do it much, much faster than you would be able to uh, in the real world or in a physical setting. This, of course, applies to animal testing and, and human testing as well in a much more significant way. But even if you're just looking to replace simple you know, three-point bending tests and so on you are from what you're doing in your lab today to using a modeling and simulation approach, you will see immediate savings. And it depends on how much of that you're able to replace, uh, which, uh, which, would, uh, which, would, which would give you your final number <coughs> that you're looking at. 
Uh, but on a more secondary level or a more implicit way, the other the other key advantage is that by running computational modeling and and simulation, you can look at many more variation variations that would be possible in the real world, uh, and you can also get much more fundamental insights into into what is really happening, which you would likely not be able to get from bench test or certainly not from animal or human test, where you might you might get a result that something works or fails to your satisfaction or meets or does not meet your performance indicator, but it's unlikely that you'll be able to pinpoint exactly why. So I think in that case, by gaining those much more fundamental and deeper insights into how your device might be performing could lead to better designs, uh, uh, lower testing in the future, and in an overall sense, then again, you know, work towards decreasing you know, the overall development time and cost by adopting modeling and simulation, both from the direct and the indirect approaches. Brilliant. Thank you, Carl. Um, we have a second question here. Um, how does the FDA view the use of CMNS? Yeah, so that's another very interesting question. And uh, so we've been working very closely with the, with the FDA both in general and uh, in particular in the context of the Living Heart Project, uh, which, I, which I briefly talked about. Uh, now, overall, the FDA is extremely supportive of this move from uh, uh, to, to, to basically include more of computational modeling and simulation in the overall design development uh, and even the approval process, and have been providing close guidance not only to us, the so systems, but to an entire consortium uh, of, of uh, medical device companies, software providers, and so on, in terms of guidance on how this might be incorporated, what types of evidence should be developed, what types of evidence uh, might be accepted for approval, how to improve it, so on and so forth. So they're very closely supportive of it. There are some areas today, particularly, for example, uh, MRI safety, where computational modeling is accepted as a proof of evidence that something that, that your device might be safe in the human body, uh, in which means essentially you can completely bypass physical testing and, and submit your results from computational simulation alone to get, uh, to get, to get past those uh, to, as proof of evidence. And in some other cases, uh, you can sub, sub, support or, or uh, augment the physical evidence that you have by providing additional computational uh, computational simulation. So the goal is eventually to move towards a much broader acceptance of simulation results, uh, both for uh, design as well as for the approval process. And it kind of depends on the device, the application, and so on. And as we get more knowledge, as we get more confidence in the accuracy of our results, I think this will keep progressing in the in uh, in a for, in a forward direction. So that's that's the general guidance we have with the FDA, and we've been working very closely with them, in particular on the human heart, uh, which uh, you know we'll be happy to share with you more information on that specific project. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question here. My company uses SolidWorks. How can we take advantage of the advanced simulation capabilities, such as the SnapFit example? Yes. So, uh, so yes. Yeah, so, what you, most of what you saw today uh, was was kind of presented in the context of the native 3D experience platform tools, which are essentially um, simulation and design tools based on uh, on Katia and Simulia. That being said, SolidWorks is very much a part of the Soul Systems offering as well, and we've taken uh, we we've, we've basically been able to ensure that you could. While you remain in your SolidWorks design environment, you can connect it to the 3D experience platform and avail of uh, of all the simulation functionality that was shown today. So basically, that 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 includes all the you know nonlinear materials functionality, contracts, snapbed, all of all of those things that were traditionally part of the Abacus world or the, or the Simulia native world, but are now exposed in a very seamless and easy to use manner for SolidWorks users who can in some sense get the best of both worlds, as in they can remain in the familiar SOLIDWORKS environment, which they like and are familiar with and are used to, but they can also seamlessly then connect uh, these designs and, and conduct simulation uh, using the much more advanced tools that are now part of the platform, including, uh, for example, being able to access high-performance computing resources on the cloud, which becomes very relevant and significant 
when you start doing things like human interactions where the models might be complicated, might take a lot more time to run, and you don't want to get bogged down or, or limit your, your local resources to running something very computational, computationally heavy. So we are seeing greater uh, interest and greater adoption of this of this connected SolidWorks 3D experience uh, mode of uh, hybrid mode of working in some sense. Great. The next question has two parts to it. Um, does the Living Heart model support the development of any cardiovascular device, and do you provide guidance on this process? Uh, yes. So <clears throat> let's see. So the first, the first part was d development of any device. So, so in theory, yes, of course. I mean, the uh, the, the the model itself is meant to represent uh, the human the human heart. It's not tuned or in any way made specific to any type of uh, device or drug or specific type of intervention. Uh, but of course, the trick in using it is having the having the background of the knowledge, both the knowledge and what we what we call knowledge and know-how, which is essentially knowing what you're trying to do and then knowing how to set that up in a computational model sense. And that, in our experience, is something that happens with, uh, with exposure. So basically, we work, you would have to know a little bit about what device you're trying to model, uh, what impact it should have on the human heart, and then run a few uh, you know, validation studies basically to get to a point where uh, you might be able to deploy the model uh, efficiently. In some cases, we work with researchers from universities who already have this knowledge and are very appreciative of of having now access to a uh, to a computational model that's developed by a third party, which takes the burden off of them, where they can focus on their knowledge of the device and the disease and leave the computational aspects to, to us, for instance. And in that case, they bring that knowledge to the table. Uh, on the other hand, we've also been working with much smaller players. So for example, somebody who has an innovative idea for a new type of heart valve or some kind of, uh, uh, you know, some kind of uh, cardiovascular improvement device, where they are, they are, in some cases, they're just physicians. Right? So they're people who have very limited understanding of modeling and simulation. And uh, in those cases, they can avail of the Living Heart Project community. They can join the community, and we've got tons of information from about seven years' worth of uh, researchers using the models. You can look at what other people have done and maybe adapt that to your purposes. Or more directly, you can reach out to us. We could help you directly ourselves or through our various uh, offices and partners all over the world. So pretty much any of these approaches are available. And I would encourage you to maybe reach out to the local, your local office to find out what's best uh, in your particular case. Thank you. Um, there's a question here. Why, when, where are the other webinars that were mentioned, and is there a link? Uh, yes, so there were a couple of things that were mentioned today. Uh, one of them is a series that we had been doing with, uh, with this organization called MDDI. Uh, let me just bring that up here for a second. Um, so this MDDI is the Medical Device and Diagnostic Industry uh, Media, basically. It's kind of they produce a, a, a magazine and, and articles around uh, medical devices in particular. And so we worked with them to do a couple of these webinars. And you can find the entire list of future and past webinars on their website called mddionline.com slash webinars. And again, MDDI stands for Medical Device and Diagnostics Industry. So mddionline.com slash webinars will give you the entire list of uh, webinars that we mentioned here, are three of which were very pertinent to this discussion today. Uh, in addition, we also talked about some of our own webinars conducted as part of the ModSim series. Uh, and I don't have a direct link to that right now, but we'd be happy to follow up. Maybe we'll just send a, a message to this uh, to the attendees today, uh, giving them more information on how exactly to go about uh, accessing those internal webinars that uh, uh, you know that makes sense for your geo and region and so on. So, so stay tuned. We'll get we'll get uh, more of that. Perfect. I'll link um, that website that you mentioned um, and make this um, a public comment so that everybody can access that um, URL. Thank you. Um, moving on to the next question. Um, what level of modal validation have you reached for organizations such as the FDA, 
Is it in a case by case model or a generic assessment received for all physical models? Um, and are there any sources that show these validation results and approval? Yes, another very good question and kind of an ongoing question with a unfortunately complex answer. So um, we can help you in specific cases. Typically when you work, so the FDA is really, let me step back for a second and just comment on that because the FDA is taking, uh, is trying to take more of a broad-based approach, which I think um, answers your question of a generic assessment of all physical models. So. In some sense, when you're trying to validate something like the human heart, of course, you have to come up with a generic representation of the heart that's acceptable. And that is what we have spent most of our effort on. So for example, if you if you access the living heart model, you will see the types of validation exercises that have been conducted. And it's essentially proving that the behavior of the heart matches with clinically observed metrics for you know average normal uh, human hearts in the 50th percentile and there's, there's a bunch of just quantitative metrics that you need to be able to meet in order to show that it's behaving uh, as expected so that's one part of it but the second part of it is uh, you if you're trying to use it as, um, as as proof of evidence for a specific device then you need to be able to construct that device and that situation um, as 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 uh, accurately as possible and that really goes by what the FDA calls a context of use. So you do have to prove that the situation of the device you're trying to show is working as expected within a very specific context of use. And as I mentioned before, that's where uh, that's where it gets trickier. It's not as simple to just say I have a reasonable heart model because the device has to interact with the heart in specific mechanical ways or electrical ways or you know, so on and so forth. And you need to be able to make sure that you're representing in your computational model what you would see in the real world. So that's something where you would need to do that to move forward with the FDA uh, in, in most situations. And that's something that, uh, like I said, the FDA themselves would be happy to collaborate uh, with you or to comment on. Uh, and there's a bunch of resources uh, like us and other experts who can help in that specific process. Thank you. Um, the next question, as of today, in modeling human organs daily operation, what remains as a major limitation to timely replication of a patient's condition in 3D modeling? How long does it take to construct um, a heart model of a patient, for example? Another very good question. Um, so again, something that we spend a lot of our time on, so I can talk for hours on this, but in simple terms, I would say we are getting increasingly better at representing the, the anatomy of the specific human organ. So in some cases, like for example, I'll just step back again a little bit, uh, in the case of human bone or orthopedics, the dental implants and so on, it's almost automatic. So you can go very easily from an MRI scan of a patient to, conduct, to constructing a 3D realistic model uh, of that patient along with material properties, so on and so forth. Uh, whereas in other organs, uh, like for example, the human heart, it's not so easy. So we are developing tools, and when I say we, I mean not just the system, but the industry as a whole, are developing better and better tools that are making it easier for the first part, which is how do I create an accurate anatomical representation of the patient that's sitting in front of me. Uh, today, it might be anywhere from hours to days to do that, depending on depending on the organ and what you're trying to do. Uh, but I think the second challenge is how do you represent the patient's physiological condition uh, as well? And that's where uh, it's still, a, it's still I would say, largely an open question. There's a lot of people and a lot of research going on in being able to extract some of that information, uh, some of it from the scan images itself, but some of it from maybe patient biometric data, like their you know, pulse and heart rate and a whole bunch of other things that you can measure through wearable devices and so on. And the convergence of these two is really what's moving the field forward. So I think there's a lot of interesting work happening there. Uh, stay tuned for more, you know, interesting, uh, you know, results or, or updates. But if there's anything specific you want to talk about, please reach out to us, and I'll be happy to uh, have that discussion. Thank you very much, Carl. There's one final question um, here. Um, are you open to collaborations with academics to deliver a different case studies? Uh, yes, of course. So this is, uh, I mean, academics form the, the crux of the bulk, I would say more than 85% of our living heart. 
project consortium is made up of various different universities all across uh, all across the world. So we would certainly encourage you to take a look at that and see if that makes sense to you as a as a kind of entry point into understanding uh, what it is about the actually wait I'm not quite sure this question was related to the human heart. So if it is the human heart, then yes, the living heart project is the place to start off with. If it's something else you would like to discuss, another human organ, for instance, then again, please reach out to our local office and we'll be happy to guide you as to uh, what's the best way to proceed. But but to answer your question in simple terms, yes, we do collaborate quite closely uh, with uh, with academics. Brilliant, thank you. Um, that's unfortunately all we have time for. So thank you for listening and I hope you enjoyed today's webinar. Um, a copy of the recording will be circulated to everyone shortly and a copy will be um, uploaded to our YouTube channel as well. Um, thank you, Carl, and thank you to Data Systems for an excellent presentation today. Um, and I hope you have a good rest of your day and goodbye. Thank you.